So really excited to uh, invite my next guest, uh, Martin Wolford. How you doing, Martin? Great, thanks, Mark. How are you? Yeah, yeah, very good. So it's been great to get to know you. Been on the uh, a couple of retreats, uh, which has been fun. Um, so how, how are you finding the property property entrepreneur experience? Yeah, it's it, it's brilliant. I, it's the second time round the track for me this year, and obviously there's there's the added, added bonus of being on the incubator as well with uh, with Dan. So I've got a business uh, going through with him, which is outside property investing but it means that i get to uh, i get the perks of coming on the board retreats with yourself and getting to surround myself with some even higher caliber of uh, of entrepreneurs so it's it's great and i'm i'm loving the whole property, property entrepreneur process anyway um and just excited for what this year is going to bring brilliant so for anybody that doesn't know you do you want to just tell you a, a bit about your background and uh, what what are you doing in in property yeah, so uh, I'm an ex-professional footballer, um, played football for 13 years, uh, a number of different levels, championship being the highest, uh, where I spent a number of years. Um, originally, when I got into property, it was just uh, an additional pension pot, to be honest. Um, the majority of my savings I'd given to a financial advisor, and I'd, I'd got a little bit of money left over, so um, just jumped in with a friend from down the pub, to be honest, is, is how it came about. I had a little bit of spare cash. So it was kind of like, do you want to, do you want to take on a project? No investor knowledge or anything back then. It was just, like I say, an additional pension pot, just somewhere different to, to put the money. And then, um, so three years, uh, I've probably been in property for about 10 years now, but for the first three years, completely passive, not paying any attention to what we're going off on site or anything really. I was just, I was just the fun in. Just going back on that then. So um, when did you start the investing? Was that after you, you finished playing football? No, no, I was still playing full-time football. So that's what I mean. I, I, I got my mind on other things on, on the game of sport. And, and yeah, it was just, uh, yeah, I, completely passive back then. I weren't paying any attention to anything when oh. we were going off. It was just... So what ages were you playing football? When was that kind of what period? So I started uh, first professor. So I, I did it a bit of a weird way compared to not normally kids get picked up at, at a very very young age, eight, yeah. eight, even even younger sometimes. I didn't. I, I would just uh, play non league football. Uh, I actually working as a land surveyor uh, at the time when I left school, uh, studying at uni as well to be a civil engineer. Um, oh, wow. So there was a pro property aspect there. Yeah, but it, it's coming absolutely no use whatsoever in that time. I've never used it. But yeah, I mean, my first professional club were then York City. They were just in the conference at the time, but that was first professional contract. And I was 19 year old when I, when yeah. I signed that. So I came into it. Just shows then. Yeah, it just shows. Yeah. You never yeah. know. Yeah. And I, I was lucky enough to then go on to uh, to have a, a pretty good career. Like, like say, I got moved to League One um, with Scumpop United. We then got promoted to a championship. Um, Brilliant. It wouldn't be an interview if I uh, if I didn't mention that I've scored the winner at Wembley to get a promoted to a championship. So wow, amazing, uh, amazing, so, yeah. So yeah, we kind of sort of mid through my my professional career that um, the opportunity to get involved in property came up, and like I say, it was just it was something or nothing initially. It was just it was kind of helping a mate out. It, it just he was kitchen fitter by trade, and I had a bit of spare cash, so we just we just jumped in. All we knew we could do is buy sell and rent we, we actually i've still got the original property actually a, a property an old shop that we turned into two flats i didn't know what, what? commercial to resi was i didn't yeah. know buy refurbish refinance was yeah um, and we what, where was to, the property it's in castleford so like right. i say i'm based in an area in um uh, in uh, wakefield in west yorkshire um so part of the five towns castleford's one of the uh one of the towns in the wakefield postcode so yeah it's still there i've still got it um and yeah, it's, we, we managed to pull all his money back out of that without even knowing really what we're doing. We just knew we, we'd both just grown up around here. So it was, it was kind of, we knew the building were cheap. Um, business partner at the time had the skills to, he literally did all the work back then. So like I say, I didn't really pay too much attention until a, till a few years into, into that journey of, of doing them. Uh, did a few flips, kept hold of a couple. Um, and then from there, start pick, picking up books, educating on money and property in itself. Then joined the networking and went all the all the way through um, different training, different strategies, um, and finally went on to the, the 
the Pin Network Simon Zucci's Mastermind program, 12, uh, 12 month program. But I couldn't go on that until I had actually retired from football then. All oh, right. Okay. So when was that? When did you actually retire? Uh, well, 33 when I retired, 37 now. So four four years ago, it was kind of around COVID that like forced, yeah. forced my hand a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, struggled to, to recover. The, the legs couldn't get going again after that. So. <laughs> what positions were you playing then? In your I was a, a winger originally, winger originally, left wing. Um, and then as I slowed down towards the end of my career, I moved into the middle a little bit, trying uh, into centre midfield. Just where I could uh, start to utilise my brain when my legs had gone. So, great, yeah, yeah. Did you enjoy it? The football yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Do, it. do you know what? Um, the, you and the property entrepreneurs are probably aware of my circumstances. There were, there were a few. I had a, a couple of rough. Uh, I had a rough period towards the end of my career that 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 tainted the whole football experience for me. That, like I mentioned, the the financial advisor that I gave uh, all my money to, he lost every penny. Um, I got trapped poorly at one of the clubs that I were at after I'd turned 30. I had a bad injury after I'd turned 30. Right. Um, my agent stopped picking the phone up to me after a certain point when I were no longer. Uh, so I had like a, a, a really rough few years inside and out of football. Within that time, I, I split with that original business partner. I split from my, my, my wife. So I had like a two year period that were just generally horrible in mm -hmm. football and out of football. And I, I, I just wanted out. Yeah. Um, but now I've had time out of the game and chance to reflect. I can look back. There were, there were a lot of highs in there, and I did I did love it overall. It was just those, right, the yeah. lows came towards the end, which is yeah. the case that that happens for a lot lot of people. Um, and because we're on this, this that's part of the the incubator business that I've taken to Dan. Like I was struggling financially after football, which I shouldn't have been. I had enough money out of the game to be comfortable. So that's part of what I'm I'm uh, I'm hoping to do with the the uh, the incubator business is uh, is take financial education um, along with the property stuff that we're doing into into football to stop uh, to stop players going through what I went through because there's uh, there's two in five still struggle financially after football two in five wow. go bankrupt so wow. I'm hoping to put a stop to that with what we what we're doing with the incubator stuff oh that's exciting yeah yeah so uh, you went on the mastermind program when when was that then uh, it was uh, Mastermind 29, so it will have been uh, 2020, I think we started that. We got, basically, whenever kind of lost my bearings, because whenever, we, we basically had one month and then lockdown happened, so oh. we, we actually got yeah. 18 months out of the 12-month the program because Simon were kind enough to uh, to extend it because we'd obviously paid for the in in-person workshops yeah. and, uh, and we couldn't do them. So he always said we would catch up on them. So we ended up getting a, a whole 18 months. So um, a lot of positive, well, positive and negative going through COVID, as you can imagine, it's it was mm. challenging to, to sort of within property itself, but we, we got six month extra value out of that program. And I came away from that with having a, a really successful year. Mastermind for me were kind of like a last ditch attempt. I were really struggling with finan financially at that point. So mm. it's kind of like, a, a last roll of the dice to because I were heading rapidly for bankruptcy and um, property were the way that I could see to get out of out of all that. And did you know what you wanted to do in property going on to the mastermind or is that part of that process to to figure out? No, I, I kind of knew. Um, well, I did know. I, I identified. I sat down before. I, I'd where we were with it with uh, the properties prior to me splitting with the the business partner we we'd started to touch on a few commercial to resi projects like small ones like commercial to resi into like sort of we did a post off into into a 10 bedroom hmo um an old derelict building into an eight bedroom hmo so that that size of thing so mm. i'd identified that there were opportunities there the there were um permitted development stuff that we could start to use so that's the strategy that i went with um and then, to be honest, the first day at the uh, at the Blueprint event for Property Entrepreneur, Dan went through the uh, the wealth hierarchy and sort of starting with cash flow, profit, and then asset. And his mantra was, "Don't skip the gears." And I immediately realised that I'd completely skipped all the gears and gone for these big asset projects. Mm. Um, and that in itself probably caused my, myself more pain in the short term because I'd gone through mastermind and created this uh it, it's kind of it's a pipeline of projects that i came out my numbers 
at the end were were four million pound expected GDV. Mm-hmm. Um, it was actually four point two, but it were all pipeline stuff. We were we were we were working his way through the first couple of projects, but um, but yeah, it was obviously the, those type of projects that we're doing take nine, 12, 18 months to, to complete. Yeah. So we weren't seeing any cash cash flow from that either. So I, I had identified the, pro, the, the, um, the strategy commercial to resi. It's what I'm still doing now, but I probably shouldn't have focused there in the very beginning. I should have probably gone for a quicker cash flowing strategy. Mm. Um, but we've got through that. Now we're working at all those projects are starting to drop and line. We're still making his way through. So, got a lot of stuff on the go at the minute we've we've just finished a, a pub to seven flats which i'll i'll run through shortly we've got um derelict building to six flats we've got another old commercial building that we're going to put eight flats and uh three commercial units we've got projects over in bridlet and that we've got that we're going to put six flats and a couple of commercial units and then we've got a bank um to to roll on to as well that's going to be another eight flats with a commercial unit underneath so within three years really um we've grown to have this really really strong pipeline of, of properties and it's it's been a learner for me because it, up until that point like i would never the work within property so i've had to sort of set up this business um and it's had its challenges because we've got a lot on we're, we're, we're mm. having to my year this year is about sort of tidying up everything that we've got behind the scenes the systems and processes because we've, yeah. we've set the ball rolling and it could quite easily spiral out of control if we don't get everything sort of yeah. uh, behind the scenes right so that's that's what we're working on now and and, yeah. and luckily for us the projects are going great at the minute so it's it's uh, that's good. Really good excellent so i think a lot of people tend to go on mastermind they, they, they get a lot of traction which is great it's, it's, it's start things moving and then uh there seems to be quite a lot then going to pro- property on to to put the systems into place I'd agree with that thoroughly. I, way yeah. I describe that to people is I went through Mastermind. I had a really successful year, but I created this really good mess. <laughs> and then I went on Property Entrepreneur to, to learn learn about the business because you don't, you don't necessarily treat property as a business, which it, mm-hmm. it 100% is. I, I definitely didn't have the mindset that I, would, I was starting to, to build this, this really big business. I was just doing property. Mm. You kind of tend to see it as... Uh, as this separate thing, property or business, when it's yeah. not, you, you are definitely in business. And once you, because we sort of moved really, really quickly, um, because we weren't aware of that, the business element of it, I, I'm like, say, sport background, I didn't have any any business background whatsoever. You, mm. you tend to overlook a lot of important stuff. And now going through, having gone round the track on Property Entrepreneur, uh, a year now like it's it's helped massively with just putting things in place behind the scenes and just operating as a business rather than yeah arms and legs and just just doing the projects yeah yeah and um we talk about the the wealth dynamics what, what's your profile uh i'm a dynamo i'm i'm green green lanyard uh, i'm very much a uh a star up in the up in the top right corner it means i'm i'm great with people um great with ideas um great at getting started on stuff seeing a project getting all excited about what i can do with it i just want the high level numbers and then away we go uh, and i can sometimes leave a bit of a mess behind me i'm not yeah. too fussed about the detail sometimes yeah. um that's about building the team to complement your skills yeah exactly that i've got a right hand man in my in my business uh, sean he's he's a lord so total opposite side of the, of the scale mm. he picks up all the pieces for me. I, I know that I frustrate him on a daily basis, but um, <laughs> he is highly valued in my uh, in my business because he uh, yeah he takes care of all that side of things for me. Excellent. So, w- what's your structure now then? So you, you're saying about we? Is it like you've got your own business, and then do you have like different uh, partners you work with on different projects? Yeah. So my my sort of trading name is Wolford Properties. That it has got. Um, the original portfolio still under, under underneath that within that business. Um, that's not moved on for, for a number of years when I started to struggle financially. Um, obviously when I first came into property, I was the funding. So my role had to switch pretty quickly. I had to then figure out a model um, 
the words and what I tried to put together was um, a, a model where I'm finding the deals, I'm set to oversee the developments, and then we've got a lettings as well um, that manages the projects when they're, when they're complete. Mm -hmm. So the, the lettings itself is a joint venture business. Um, and then underneath the, the wolf of property umbrella of, of what we look after, basically, the, there's three three other main joint venture partners within that that are all, again, commercial to resi focus. So I've got um, a business called Orate Property with with uh, Hugh Davis off the Property Entrepreneur Programme. Um, mm -hmm. I've got Hunford Homes with uh, with Tom Jeffs, who's also a property entrepreneur. And then I've got um, MKM Property, which is uh, it's a guy called Neil Neil Abraham. He's uh, outside of the uh, property entrepreneur circle, but but went through the Mastermind Programme. So oh, right, yeah. they're all sort of very experienced and, and and high level and there's a lot of comfort in that for me my role within that is finding the deals overseeing the development and then managing them yeah. um, when they're done their role primarily is the funding so that's yeah. what they bring to the table and then we they're, they're 50 50 businesses uh in themselves but there's a lot of comfort in the the caliber of people that i'm working with i, I can go to them i can sense check things yeah uh, they, they've that's all good. got a great understanding of business and property so yeah um if there's ever anything that i've missed or overlooked then they're there yeah, to that's an opinion on, on things and i think you yeah, have like similar values to people within the prop property entrepreneur community I yeah think. absolutely absolutely it works ever so well like we like to say there's uh there's different wealth dynamics going off in all those businesses but mm -hmm. the values like you say the values are very much uh aligned um with what we're trying to do and what we're trying to uh, trying to achieve that's good so let's go through the deal then so um do you want to just tell us what what it what the property is and whereabouts it is in the country yeah so uh, i picked this one out like i say uh, of, a, of a pipeline of properties we've got i picked this one out because it's it's gone full circle um well we're, we're just in the refinancing process of this now so we've, we've got all the numbers that the numbers are, are actual so um Thought it was the best one to run through. Um, it's an old pub um, based in Castleford, in yeah. uh, like say in the Wakefield postcode again, West Yorkshire. Um, and we converted this into into seven seven flats. Um, do you want me to run through the numbers? Well, let's let just talk uh, how you actually sourced the deal. So, how, how did you come across the deal? Uh, so this one is from a uh, an old relationship in property, if you like. So we've uh, the owner of this has also got a, a portfolio of of single let properties, and we actually having gone through the it were actually prior to mastermind. Actually, well, it were when I'd done the uh, the mastermind accelerator and learned all the different strategies uh, yeah. about rent to rent. So. Uh, just went and, and gave that a go basically. And I've, I've got, I've still got one of his properties that I've got on a rent to rent basis. So okay. um, single let to HMO um, rent to rent. So I've had the relationship um, quite a while, quite a number of years. And the guy's plan was always to, when he retired from the pub was to develop it. He actually went through planning for a knockdown rebuild scheme, but it didn't quite work. The numbers didn't work on that. Mm -hmm. So we went back into planning for seven flats, which is how I bought it. Um, there were issues with the plans and stuff, which we can come on to. But yeah, the, the, it was through the relationship of of getting out there and, and just doing property in general. And this one in particular, where we'd, we'd agreed a, a rent to rent and we'd looked after him for a number, a number of years, just made sure everything went smoothly on on a on a small project, on a rent to rent yeah, yeah. and, and bigger things come of it. That's great. So I think it's obviously building relationships, um, doing a good job, and you just never know where that can take you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That we've had others that we've we've picked off market. There's kind of low hanging fruit sometimes on the commercial to resi. We've had some that's uh, been direct to vendor and uh, just work through the follow up process and come back to us years on. But this one in particular, we just like I say, it was just uh, it, it came through building a re relationship on a on a really small project and then this one came available at a later date okay so let's uh, go through how you stack the deal then so uh it had planning for seven flats that didn't work what were some of the issues then that you, you that you saw with the planning so the plans that he'd had drawn up that, that obviously 
he'd obviously purely gone through planning for the for the financial gain to to get that um to get that gain but um there were things like um the staircase ran in the center of the building and it were all encased within the building so from from um from building regs point of view from the fire regulations that that didn't work there were no means for smoke to escape if there were ever a fire so um we had to completely redesign um the first floor so that we could uh we could get the the landing area um to have a an external window and stuff like that so mm -hmm. but that were a complete redesign of the whole first floor um and in the basement um he got plans passed through planning for two flats down there but um the head height in the basement weren't sufficient to put a suspended ceiling underneath it weren't high enough anyway to even have a flat but then let alone putting a suspended ceiling underneath for uh for the acoustic for the sound purposes yes. um so we had to uh so that 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 whole scheme may not have worked. Luckily for us, we identified that on the ground floor there were quite quite a lot of head height. So we we identified that we could remove the the entire ground floor to the basement and raise raise everything up. So we we completely took all that out um, and put how, both. How much floor. did you raise it up by? Uh, it was it won't have been far off. Um, it won't be far off a meter, to be honest, wow. with where we went. It was yeah. quite, um, yeah, quite a bit. And then we put the whole, um, the floor back as well as the suspended ceiling. And then yeah. what that meant as well is that um, the head height became tight on the on the ground floor to put under the suspended ceiling underneath. So we actually put, rather than putting a suspended ceiling underneath the uh, underneath the first floor, we actually put another floor in on the first floor. Yeah. So again, that meant every every wall pretty much on the first floor coming out, um, and yeah, it, it like I say, it would identify in that. Don't get me wrong, I did all that. I identified all that those issues prior to buying it, but it left. Mm -hmm. It also left a couple of opportunities when when people go through planning uh, solely if they're just one off, if they're just going through planning to get it sold, they go very lazy through planning. Yeah. Um, so within that redesign we managed to turn a two bed into a huge three bed um, that they weren't utilizing the space and then there were a studio in the basement that the planners had knocked back um to only be able to use half the footprint of the basement because of uh, they were claiming you couldn't get enough natural light in there mm -hmm. um well when i looked at the plans um i'd seen that they'd put the bathroom at the front of the building where the light were coming in Mm -hmm. um, and if you know anything about it, you know that bathrooms don't need any natural light. So again, just by moving the bathroom to the back of the building and, and opening up more windows at the front, we managed to turn what would have been a small studio into a pretty large um, one bed flat, um, which adds again, significant value. But when I'm stacking the project up, I'm obviously working with the owner based on, on what he's got, what he's got planning for. Um, yeah. So the numbers yeah. that I had in on for the GDV were based off a, a studio uh, in the basement incident and a, and a two bed in the other one that we that we changed as well rather than a three. So I, I'd that identified yeah, yeah things on the plan where I could add, add significant value. That's great. Do you want to just uh, go through your process as to how you make your offers because you were saying as to how you you work back from the GDV and I think anybody listening I think this could be yeah uh, this could be good. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm completely transparent with uh, with the vendors as well with with when I'm putting my offer in. I'll I'll literally list out my numbers. Um, all right, within that, there's probably me being a bit conservative on things like end value um, and development costs, but I list it out. So I, I the first thing first for me it's it's figuring out what I think the GDV will be. Um, mm -hmm. So what Which is, is the, the gross development value? So that's the end value of all the flats. At the, yeah. at the end yeah 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 so what is the end value um and then from there i'll state to the owners look on a project like this um i uh, i don't work for anything less than a 25 percent profit margin because i know for me i know that that's uh that's my no money down figure yeah um but when i'm uh when i'm putting that forward to to the owners it's kind of like well the reason for that is like there's a lot of risk that goes into projects like this there's everything that's going off in the world there's material cost rises there's market uncertainty so i'm pretty open that look i'm going to take a 25 percent profit margin out of this and here's the reasons why yeah 
Um, so end value are minus 25% straight away. Um, and then from there, I'm working out what is the development cost. Um, mm -hmm. So I've got um, sort of really basic uh, back of a fag packet figures of what gets me into negotiation um, mm -hmm. based off what I've, I've uh, working with my builder. And, and that's come from experience of building that relationship. So I'll put start putting my um, estimates forward based on those sort of fag packet numbers. And then, like I say, take the development cost off and that brings me to my offer essentially. And I'm fully transparent with, with where I am. Um, this one, for example, the owner wanted 250,000. My first offer um, was 100,000. Um, and the way that I put that forward is is kind of like, look, I appreciate this is, is kind of way off where you were expecting, but here's my reasons. Here's the full transparency of, of mm. why I'm doing what I'm doing. Here's why my build costs are where they are. Mm. Um, and I'll just put that forward. It's like, look, I, I don't I don't want to not offer you this, um, but I appreciate it may not be where you want to be. So um, maybe we need to look at something a little bit more creative. And on this one, the, um, like I said, I do go conservative on the end value. Um, I didn't know that the, the owner had actually had a RICS valuation done. So he actually ran my own calculation with my 25% profit margin. He ran that back to me. Um, and it, it came out at um, 180,000 on the, on the, uh, on the offer price at that point. Um, mm. so I'm like, okay, well, we're getting somewhere closer. I can, I can get the builder out. We, we can show this up and see where we're going. Cause at that point I know that, look, I've managed his expectations on the 250,000 yeah. with that. We're yeah. now down talking figures at, at 180. It's, it's, yeah. it's starting to look like a decision either way. So I then get the builder out, um, and I'll just show it up then. So we'll again, it's it's still back of a fag packet stuff, but it's the builder giving his experience, which is more than mine again. So he's looking yeah. at different stuff. And just the point on that, when you're doing say, because I know these are a mix of like one, twos, and threes, what's your uh, ballpark figures that you use on say a flat? Do you have one just for a flat, or do you, do you have like a different yeah. number for one and a two? How does that work? Yeah, so the three were an anomaly. We, that came about because we, we're not normally looking to do three beds. So normally we, we're sort of averaging out between ones and twos and trying to get a scheme that's that's yeah. a balance of them. Yeah. Um, at the minute now, with the price rises, I'm I'm factoring in forty five grand a flat. Um, this one came in less than that, um, but like I say, we've we've been hit now with yeah. uh, material cost rise and stuff like that. Yeah. So generally speaking. I would take a view on it if it were coming in at like 42 and a half on my figures, but yeah. 45 gives me, like I said, that little bit of conservativeness and I'll yeah. as well, I will, I will bake in a, a contingency within that as well, which again, I'll be transparent to the. Yeah. And is that, an is that an average for a one or and a two or is that? Yeah. And it's, it's purely specific to my builder. So he, he just, that's the way he operates and he, yeah. he sort of, uh, he probably explains that better to me why he, why it's it is fine we're just taking that average some things work yeah. out more some things work yeah. out less but that's yeah. that is literally just to get me in negotiations yeah. at that yeah. point yeah and then I, before we've sort of shaken hands like I say I'll get the builder out and and just say look I'm am I missing anything like what do yeah. you think is there any structural stuff that I'm not seeing in this instance I'd not I'd not seen that the roof um the roof needed um work so again that's why the 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 offer price went back down from 180 down to to 145 which is what we what we shook hands on because the builder had seen um little bits that that yeah. i don't so he then just shook like like say he's like oh well um you know what i mean yeah you you've not factored in you're gonna have to move that entire wall you're gonna need structurals or yeah what he'll see little bits on top yeah. of what i've seen so then yeah. at that point i can i can shore up the uh the offer a little bit more and then when i've shaken hands with the owner to say right we've got deal agreed at 145 grand in this instance at that point i'll start doing the paid due diligence so it's like yeah. right let's have now a look at the plans that, that don't work currently but can we yeah. make it work yeah um do i need to this one came with a rick's valuation but um if if not on some of the other projects at that point, I might get a Rick's valuation back up what I'm doing. I'll I'll get was, plans was, was the was the Rick's valuation on the current value or the end value? On the end. 
right okay yeah, yeah. value yeah um he may have had one on the uh <laughs> on, on it one but he weren't sharing that with me so uh maybe maybe that were why it were easy to manage his expectations on that if he'd, uh, yeah. if he'd already got that behind the scenes but uh, yeah. but okay yeah. yeah that's good and so let's then go through how you structured this deal so was this uh did you do this in uh, an spv like a, a standalone limited company for this and then how did you fund it was this like with a partner as well so this was the second one in uh, in, a, in one of the JV companies that I've got. This was the second one in uh, in Orate Property, which is which is the one with Hugh. Yeah, um, we'd rolled uh, straight off of. We were already in in progress and doing well with uh, with another pub actually. Just coincidentally, I got dubbed the pub guy at one point, but I weren't purposely <laughs> uh, actively looking to shut pubs down across the country. I was just uh, just picking up the deals. But um, yeah, so this was the second one in that business. Um, that's now grown. We've got we've got projects um, three and four, threes on the way, and fours the the bank that I mentioned that will that will roll on to. So that's a 50-50 joint venture. Hugh came in, he funded the purchase, and then we went out to investors and uh, and development finance um, to to fund the development. So okay, yeah, that's kind of how we structure it. Yeah. Okay. So you got the uh, deal agreed. Um, was there any issues as far as on, on the conveyancing side? Uh, conveyancing, no, no. That that went through uh, relatively smooth, to be honest. Conveyancing were all right. We were buying cash as well, so we didn't have any 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 issues there. Yeah. Um, we got it through um, pretty quickly, to be honest. And the owner were kind of pushing us to get it done by the end of end of April um in we got the years 2020 i think it was um no no 21 um but then he realized that it's still got some um uh, some alcohol in the cellar and it will bank holiday the next month so he asked us to uh to delay it slightly so he could just sell off the rest of his uh his booze that were potentially going out of date but anyway <laughs> um but now the conveyance side all went all went well um like I say, we had we had numerous challenges going through the development. Um, we had, uh, like I say, old buildings. You you always get something, and on this one, yeah. um, we'd removed a non-structural wall, um, but the external of the building was sat above that wall, um, and a timber beam had uh, entirely rotted away over time. So when we we took what we thought was well, it was supposed to be a non-structural wall, but it had become mm. structural. And when we took that out, the the beam snapped and and the wall above it sort of came with it. So mm. um, that wore 10 grand out of the contingency there straight away. Um, and what which, contingency did you put in? Did you put 10% or did you put like a, a notional amount? Or how, how did you work that? 10% in general, and then we'll take a view on it. If it's a, if it's a standard sort of, office block where it's all cleared out you can pretty much see everything everything's uniform yeah um then we can take a view on whether we need as much with yeah. i'd very rarely go too much under the 10 percent um in this one in hindsight we probably with it with the complications of uh it, it was a very old cobbled together uh building um that had been extended in different areas over over time as as they've gone so i think in hindsight we probably should have built in a little bit more yeah i think with pubs the they do had the uh extensions but also then they uh they try and create like one open space don't they so then yeah. they take away a lot of like supporting walls and things like that so you just never know i think yeah no yeah if, if anything i would probably to take on a project like that again i'd probably put the uh, building a little bit more to be honest um because we did we did use all the contingency if not if not slightly more so yeah um so yeah it, it did have its challenges with the development with old buildings like this you, there's always something we're, we're finding different stuff on different sites that you just can't possibly foresee everything um sure. that i know i'm getting a lot more experience with what to look out for as, we, as we're going along but I think it's all experience, isn't it? The more projects you do, the more things you come across, you overcome those problems that then you bear them in mind then. The yeah, future. exactly. Yeah. But if you're just building the contingency and I, but property is a constant problem solving exercise anyway, I, yeah. I, I kind of relish in that in that challenge, knowing that it's going to throw something at us that, and yeah. it's just a case of how we, how we deal with it moving forward. Yeah. I think w one thing that quite surprised me was the size of the, uh, the flats because that actually... 
um they're all pretty big and looking at like the average i think the average size of them was 57 square meters yeah so they yeah, were big yeah. weren't they yeah i think the three bed itself i think i think that's i think that's close to 90 think square seven. meters i think yeah we we could have we we could have uh we could have swept this out a lot more, to be honest. We could have probably got at least one, if not another two flats in there, but it came with planning. It weren't too much of an issue. We just thought, let's just get on with it. Let's yeah. build out. We just needed to make a few amendments rather than, yeah. Uh, yeah. Rather than going through. So we just chose to build out. Yeah. So do you want to just run through the numbers then? Um, yeah. Yeah. So headline numbers. Yeah. Yeah, so I've already mentioned we we bought this for one hundred forty five thousand. Um, the development on this well came in at three hundred twenty thousand, like all in fees, running costs, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So total of four hundred sixty five thousand. Um, that valued up. Um, I've got in front of me a six forty, but that's not true. It, the valuation came in at six uh, six twenty five on that. Um. And I think the, the amount we re released on refinance, uh, it's 462-ish is the, is the number that we that we came in on there. But we we managed to get all his money back out of that one. Um, and then that's now fully let um, while it's going through that financing process for 4,250 a month is the income. Um, the expenses, including the mortgage, um, is or will be when that kicks in. We, we have got the figures. Um, it's 2,705 per month. So it's going to cash flow um, just over 1,500, 1,545 pounds um, a month that will cash flow us. So, right. um, so you've happy. got like 18 grand a year coming out, none of you on cash in. So it's kind of like infinite return then. It is, yeah, and they were, they were never. It, I was delighted with that actually because it was never my money, and it. it was always going to be an infinite return for me, which is which yeah. is great. Obviously, the way that I've I've structured the business, but at the same time, um, I'm desperate. It probably even more so than if it were my own cash. I'm desperate to sort of over deliver for the joint venture partners mm -hmm. as well. So, it's nice going back and and giving them the news that, that that's where the numbers are because they weren't, yeah. they weren't, um, they, they were potentially, I always give them the worst case scenario or, uh, sort of try and estimate the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And if they're happy with that, yeah. Um, then we go ahead. So the, the worst case scenario in stuff like this is, is there is money locked in. Um, and like I say, it's always nice to be going back and, and saying, look, we've, we've got all your money back out as well. So it's, it's free for us both at that point. Yeah, brilliant. So uh, let's just go through top three tips. So what would you say looking back would be your top three tips for anybody listening? Um, with projects like this specifically, I'd probably say that uh, just be aware that if you buy anything with planning, that uh, planning and building regs, they're two completely different departments and they don't communicate with each other. So just because something's got planning, doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's actually feasible to build. Um, we had to go around the houses quite substantially on this one just to make it work. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas it could quite possibly not be feasible. And if you think mm -hmm. you're buying buying a, a building with planning permission for seven flats and you can't physically do anything with it, then yeah, uh, you got to be aware of that. Uh, the second one, um, again, specific is. Uh, is just make sure you're building the contingency. I touched on this as, as I was running through. Um, th there's not been one of my projects yet that hasn't thrown some kind of curveball at us. Some, some are, are, are relatively small, but some can be uh, a little bit chunkier. So just make sure that you're that you're building in that contingency. Um, and tip three is is don't get tempted to fudge the numbers. Um, the, the numbers where work where they work. Um, don't be thinking, ah, oh, yeah, but if I can get the development cost done for slightly cheaper, or mm. yeah, if if this happens, or maybe I don't need that contingency. Like, mm. if the numbers don't work, um, well, find the price where the numbers do work for you and stick at that. Mm. Like, say, my offer went in on this, and I would I would expecting to get laughed out the out the door when when my initial offer were down close to a hundred thousand. Um, but just by that, yeah, that. which just shows right. you that's like sixty percent less than the asking price. Yeah, and I think it's just, I think framing it as to kind of like where your number is and just trying to like support that um, 
I think really helps. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. And don't get tempted if, if like I say, if the owner had, has, has stuck to his guns at 200,000, like the temptation might have been there to start saying, oh, well, yeah, if I, if, if it only takes us like, uh, if I do it without the contingency or if I get the, yeah. the development costs, like I say, now we've, we've factored in 45 grand a flat, like for everything internally. So it's like, oh, well, maybe I can get that done for 40. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's avoiding doing that. You, your numbers are there as, as the, the, the rule from the off and just making sure you stick with that because you, you will get found out on the back end if you're trying to just force a deal through. Yeah, I think the the other thing with that is it's surprising how many deals do fall through. So I think sticking to what your offer is and you just never know, maybe like, you know, one in three does fall through and uh, you're always there then. To exactly, follow that. exactly that. We're in, we're, in, uh, we're in development on a building at the minute that's that's currently underway. We're at an old derelict building in, uh, in Pontefract, so very similar area. But um, our initial conversation over that building war with over three years ago mm. um and that one at the time that the owners were intending to develop themselves and the, they weren't interested in the money that we were willing to pay them and like I say after after close to three years um they came back to us and were like oh we've decided we're not going to develop out now so um it's back on the table and we're interested at in the figure that you're talking so that one came around and, and came a deal just um, like I say leaving it with them and just touching base every now and again mm. if if there's no movement with the building if you can see that it's still yes. sat yeah. there in a couple of years time it's just a case of just touching base and yeah fantastic yeah seeing where they are yeah so if anybody wants to contact you what kind of things um are you interested in and do you want to just share your contact details yeah so the things that we're interested in a minute I've 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 got a slot for another project. So if anybody's in the Wakefield area that's got similar projects, um, I am uh, I am looking for for one more that, that slots into the pipeline, and we do we are willing to pay uh, decent um, sourcing fees on that. Um, and then we're we're also the flip side of that is we're, we're always looking for for investors, people to uh, to cut the cost. We we go out to the banks first. Uh, whatever the, the price is 13 15 percent and then i i've got a good relationship with my uh my SaaS provider that, that then will beat the banks and then i'm always trying to then beat their costs with with building up relationships with private investors and uh and getting that cost down and then we do offer because i do a little bit of coaching and mentoring as well we we do offer a, an, an earn as you learn as well so if that gets everything that we can cut on the development cost um while helping other people get a good return or helping them learn at the same time, then we're always interested in that. Um, and my contact details. So, um, I mean, my email is probably a safe way to get older than me. It's Martin, which is uh, spelled really awkward, awkwardly. It's uh, M-A-R-T-Y-N. <laughs> yeah. uh, Wolford Properties, which is W-O-O-L-F-O-R-D uh, Properties, I-E-S, dot co dot UK. Um, but I'm, relatively active on social media um instagram's the one that i use the most probably so um if you want to uh, see what we're doing i'm regular updating on there that's um at woolly 11 so w-o-o-l-y 11 um and yeah just any of the other social medias if you're if you're interested if uh, if anybody's interested at that point if they reach out i'm always happy to, to swap numbers and have a conversation but um if they reach out to me first then i'll be i'll be happy to pass that on as well Excellent. Great news. Well done on the on the development and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks for having me on as well. All right. Cheers, Martin. See you. Take care. Bye-bye.